horrible thing the last day. It, 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 uh, it's horrible because it's the last day, and it's horrible because it's like I've been told to There's a lot of pressure. I have to get a photo now. Anyway, what we're going to do today in this incredible system that I have is uh, go through the last, I don't know, 20, 30 pages of this uh, strange thing called um, I, I swear I saw this. And um, I wanted to at some point. Uh, let's put that on the board. Uh, How are all you guys standing up? Last night was my first night, I would say, almost not to sleep. And I got here, I don't even know, six or seven days ago. So we're going to do chapter 16. Uh, uh, the end, it contains, um, it's a book, um, it's a notebook, um, it's a field work notebook. Um, I'll give it to you um, uh, as a contribution towards the impossible. Uh, style, strategies, uh, <coughs> fun, inspiration, uh, picture criticism, uh, and the notebook has a strange thing after it uh, called an afterthought. And so the aim is there is sort of two ends, uh, the spin one and the spin two, after a board. So, so I guess it's chapter 16, chapter 17, I think it's chapter 18, and then there's this uh, uh, document which sort of Uh, point 
mixed in with the real life stuff. Yeah, and you know, one thing I've got to tell you, I, I just hate those words so much. I think they're, they're such bullshit words. You know, like I was in some sort of confrontation in a, in a department in a university once, and um, and um, this about 1993, and there was this sort of very um, uh, tense uh, standoff between the professors and the graduate school. The graduate department was really in deep psychotic state, and so forth. And one of the students said, you know, they all came to and said, we've got to talk more about class, gender, and race, which, you know, it, it, on the surface of it is great. But it felt to me in that context so um, sort of PC, and I thought, the minute you use those words now, you've sort of destroyed uh, the fire uh, that they once had in the academy. You know, you've got to find a way of uh, continually moving, I suppose, with, uh, to, with the fashion or to beat the fashion, or not to put things, take things out of their cliched status. You know, and this is a very extreme example, because what could be more noble than talking about class, gender, and race, right? But it's like, look, look, look. it just became like this uh, automatic sort of thing, and you know, somehow what should be a helped thought Becomes uh, um, becomes a hindrance, and so when I start off this morning, this afternoon, and talk about political la la la, you know, I don't, I mean it, but I'm not really into it. I don't think it's a good way to talk, and um, I think that uh, conveying situations and people, uh, and uh, quite often yourself, because you know, uh, to keep the self out of this is, uh, I think, uh, boring and um, uh, lends itself to uh, abstractions. The um, afterthoughts, um, not so much a process of editing, meaning cutting out, but of uh, adding, <laughs> adding more and more layers uh, to it, wondering what, what I left out, what needed to be said, and one idea generated another. I think, um, you know, part of the, um, the issue is to deal with, in this, in this document, is to deal with uh, witnessing, right? Um, and if you put down the bed, let um, me get my notes here. Um, sorry, I've got to make certain I don't lose any papers. Um, <coughs> um, if you take like a heading, uh, an epigraph on, I think it's chapter 17, I'm sure, from Benjamin where it says, as long as there is a beggar, there will still be magic. I mean, I find that a very really strange and original mm -hmm. statement. And I think the manuscript as a whole is tied up with such uh, conundrums. Um, <coughs> what is meant by this? Um, uh, surely uh, a Marxist would be invested in an enlightenment uh, procedure which would be eliminated. Uh, any sense of uh, any sense of magic. Um, I, I I wanted very much to get across the idea because um, uh, it was necessary in talking about a drawing that's done in a, a moment of uh, well, let's just call it a strange moment for the moment. Uh, required uh, <coughs> uh, an unearthing, uh, even an excavation. Uh, I guess it's the same thing of um, of, of, a, of a magical. Quality uh, of the image, and what I call in one of these in the chapters uh, the the production of a swarm of spirits uh, as a result of uh, what I call the negative sacred. And so I think the afterthought is is actually uh, an admission that these things are necessary to talk about, but uh, uh, somewhere between impossible and very very difficult. Um, and I felt that I have. Um, some uh, leverage or some license uh, to sound these depths, to, to touch these themes, um, because of the um, uh, because of the my experiences um, in, in field work, um, and I, I keep wondering what it would be to add these sorts of words to um, an intellectual. <coughs> rational um, <coughs> reaction. Uh, I was going to use the word analysis, but uh, I guess it's an analysis, but I prefer the word reaction uh, to um, a moment in my life or uh, a, a, a moment in society. So I think the afterthought 
folks are really involved with, with that. But one thing that the after war does very much is sort of try and make up ground in terms of the relationship between facts and stories. Uh, facts, stories, philosophy, you know, facts, stories, theories. And I was quite surprised how um, lengthy that element became. I was really, um, uh, really, really surprised. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute and um, the place of the fact. Because I had registered or I had become so um, um, hostile uh, to the notion of what's called by positivistically minded people or people unthinkingly being positivistic. They talk about data, data. <coughs>
talking about Brian Dyson, talking about how he um, had to leave uh, Morocco, or he had to leave the nightclub that he formed, A Thousand of My Notes, in 1958, I think, and he describes coming, cleaning out the ventilator <laughs> and coming across this uh, sorcery package, and he lists the items. And I, to me, that was so much grist to my mill because you've got these sort of facts, I call them facts now, but of course they're like, uh, they're like atomic bombs. Uh, you know, it's got the seven seeds, the seven marble pebbles, uh, seven bits of mirror, the profile of himself about the size of a thumbnail, the bull's head, and then this square, this piece of paper on which they, this, he says this Kabbalistic square uh, in which is written something like, May you uh, leave, uh, like the hot air or the burnt air, leaves this, uh, leaves this area. And um, I've been thinking all along about, well, why don't we write like um, Kabbalistic spells? What, uh, in, in what, what, mm, what insight might we get? Might, what enthusiasm might we get uh, using that idea as a, as a stimulus for our, for our own work? Um, without necessarily believing in sorcery, but finding something in that which um, uh, allows us to arrange uh, <coughs> radical, empirical uh, writings in a notebook uh, to appreciate the possible effect they can have <coughs> instead of being um, nothing more than steps towards a, a polished, uh, polished final work. So I can't really... Um, I think I, I think I'm answering your question in the same way as I was, I was writing those afterthoughts. That, that as, you know, struggling to find a, 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 to create something that's close to a narrative that is a narrative, uh, but um, is, is thinking about everything that is that has gone before. Um, so it's not much of an answer. I I'm, I think most writing is very hard work. I mean, most, most writers say that, they, uh, that you just have to be at it, uh, you know, many hours a day, uh, seven days a week sort of thing, and um, <coughs> gradually it, it, it comes together. Um, all sorts of complicated decisions are made, um, and I can't answer much, much better than that. That was, uh, was an answer, and was, uh, that was a pretty cool answer. Um, Look, when we, if we jump ahead a bit, and um, I, one of the themes that really occurs to me is um, how might you answer that question about the Benjamin thing, about as long as there is a beg as long as there is one beggar, there will be magic, which I took as a license to sort of plow ahead and think about, uh, I mean, go further than I have already in this, in this class, further than we've already gone in this manuscript. Um, Trying to relate um, magic to oppression, magic to um, to horror, magic to the negative sacred, and one of the questions I have is, well, what is the negative sacred? Uh, you know, I thought I had it very clear in my mind <laughs> until I uh, sat down this morning or yesterday and started to think through uh, that those words, that concept, and I think it's uh, very important to talk talk about it today. Um, I think the um, uh, negative sacred is very related in this work to something that's already been questioned uh, in this class, which is the uh, uh, normality of the abnormal. Um, and I think that the um, this left-handed sacred is very much what um, is at stake in Primo Levi's description of, uh, of Auschwitz. So um, let's um, let's talk a bit about uh, in, in chapter sixteen um, uh, what is meant by what is meant by, by the negative sacred and its relationship to the abnormality of the um, uh, 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 related to the let me stop there. So again, what, how it relates to the function. Any focus on this? Any contributions? Um, Sacred, negative, sacred, uh, positive, sacred. It sounds a bit uh, simplistic. It's got a positive version, you've got a negative version. Um, any take 
focus on that. It's a heady mixture, right? And uh, the, the college was formed by this 
these guys, a bit like MGS, a bit like it. It was more like a boys' club, and it was you know, <laughs> uh, uh, called the College, uh, the, the College of Sociology, and it lasted about 18 months, and uh, from 1938 to 39, and then everybody was sort of split for obvious reasons, and um, a few people were taken prisoners, prisoner and never seen again. Uh, the uh, the topic of discussion for the College of Sociology was something they called sacred sociology, which uh, I was just amazed when I saw this. I mean, I, I had nothing very well educated. I didn't know anything about this. And uh, a book came out in English in 1991 uh, or 92 called <coughs> the College of Sociology. And it was a collection of, of talks given during those 18 months, edited by a, a guy called Olier, H-O-L, or H-O-L-L, I-D-R, uh, Dennis, Denis. And it's really, really the most fabulously interesting book. If you can get it, uh, get a hold of it. It hasn't been reprinted and it's, it's, a, little, it's a little difficult to get. Um, but this, well, when I was, uh, I was so excited to see that you could have this mixture of Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, who else will be tossing here? Yeah. That's enough. I think that's pretty much it. Oh, and ethnography. That's what was so important to me. So it gives you a good insight into where I sort of come from. I mean, this mix of Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, and ethnography, but in a new key, let's say, seen in a new way, uh, that, was their, that was their recipe. That was their uh, guiding lights, you know, and behind Nietzsche's Hegel and all this stuff, stuff, stuff. Um, and they wrote like poets. I mean, the, the Tysol thing, although it's, I think he's very hard to, to read, uh, but he's fun to read in his surrealist phase because he's so wacky, wacko. Like his essay on the big toe is just a marvel. It's wonderful. And that's in the Visions of Excess by, um, by George Bataille. And that's a book you should really, really get. It's a you know, relatively cheap paper, <coughs> Visions of Excess uh, by George Bataille. And that's his surrealist phase, 29 to 33 sort of thing. And uh, so... The, the sacred, um, uh, they saw the sacred, like, in, like this is my, I'm making a bit of this up, but in medieval Europe, in the so called primitive societies that were coming back through ethnography and, and missionaries, uh, the ports and all this, um, the growth of fascism in Western Europe, so obviously a powerful uh, ideological slash sacred force. Uh, it suddenly seemed to these guys who were all caught up in revolution in one way or another as revolutionaries or would be or want to be, you know, religion seemed to become suddenly incredibly important. And more than that, this thing they called the sacred. And, and so their task was to say, well, what, what the hell is this thing? You know, what, what do we mean by sacred? And we, we feel intuitive that it's a huge force in modern politics. Not, not the politics of, a, of, an, of a, say, an African uh, village politics of an African kingship or, or a, a Maori kingship, not only there, but right here in Western Europe, uh, you know, this thing called the sacred, but it's been sort of flattened uh, for intellectuals because of uh, that thing we call enlightenment. And it was, so it's sort of hard to engage. How do you use the tools of enlightenment uh, to, to engage with this? One of the ways was through literature, poetry, and, and art, right? And particularly through the theory of uh, Bataille's interest in poetry is taking language uh, to, its, its, to its extremes. Now, my brain is so fuzzy, but I think one of the things I would... Um, Michel Lloris uh, wrote this... Uh, this is nothing like what I wanted to talk about. That's <laughs> uh, Lloris... Um, Michel Lloris has an essay, a tiny essay, called uh, The Sacred in Everyday Life. I, should, I don't know if I put it on the list. Uh, the um, stuff that I sent out <coughs> the fourth course. No. Oh, that's a big mistake. Yeah. No, it's, um, <laughs> it's, in, um, it's in the College of Sociology, book that I was just talking about, edited by Danny Collier. I think it's one now. Um, translated by Betsy Wynn. Um, 
Amen. They say Benjamin used to sit in the back row, and it was on top of a bookstore somewhere in Paris. Imagine the scene, you know, like Paris, 1938, 39, what's happening in Western Europe? I mean, it's really scary. Right wing, left wing, communists, social democrats. Uh, nasty stuff going to happen. A bit like the US right now. Um, and um, Benjamin used to sit in the back, they say. I read somewhere, and shaking his head. <laughs> like, can't believe what's going on with these crazy French people. <laughs> But he loved Paris, he had no money, and, uh, you know, he uh, put in time with these College of Sociology people, although I think he held them at arm's length. And Michel Derry comes along, this natty little guy, uh, and uh, talks about uh, the sacred in everyday life. And I think this is a really important title, because it's trying to sort of have your cake and eat it. It's trying to be secular and religious at the same time. Uh, it, uh, it consists of this speaker who I guess is in his mid-30s talking about what is sacred meant to him as a child. So he's doing this sort of complex, interesting thing of, of going back to childhood. You're dealing with your memories. And he, he runs through four or five uh, memories, each one of which is meant to make a point about uh, the sacred. See, I'm telling you this as a way of saying, well, what the hell is the sacred? And trying to get you and guys off the hook here um, a little bit, because it's too hard a question. Because um, you end up putting your foot in it. You know? And um, one of the examples he gives are like the uh, advertisement, advertisement, you say, on uh, a cocoa can, which will be a picture uh, maybe of, I don't know what the picture might be of, His father's silver Smith and Wesson pistol, um, the uh, games he played with his brother locked in the bathroom, uh, the closed door to the parents' bath, uh, the bedroom, uh, the nearby race course, and the silks uh, <coughs> the machine of the jockeys' uh, outfits. Um, most of all, he remembers the adventures with language, how uh, as kids they would get words wrong. <coughs> And uh, I know I've done that a lot as a kid, and I think you all have, that you, um, you hear an adult word and you twist the syllables around. I can only think of, of course, this silly example in my own case, which is, um, instead of curvaceous, I would say curcavious or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it sounded just absolutely perfect for what you thought the word meant. And um, he and his... Uh, uh, brothers and sisters would make up words for uh, objects in the, around the house and, and in their games. And actually most of the essay is spent on um, these childhood games with language, which the kids don't necessarily think of as games. They just think, I don't know, it's part of being alive. Um, and um, so he summarizes by saying, well, if I have to say what the sacred is, it's something that's full of ambivalence, I think that's a huge um, term for these guys. If they take it from a Durkheim, uh, well, what do I have to write down? Something like that. Um, uh, I'm going from that has uh, danger or connotations of danger, maybe the fire, the values, um, that uh, is, is, is attractive, but at the same time uh, frightening. So that's a bit of a time thing that the sacred will be absolutely loaded to the gills. Is that an expression? Absolutely full of <laughs> uh, seductive power, and at the same time, uh, uh, Repulsion. Repulsion. Huh? Repulsion. Yeah, repulsion. Well, that's about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think here we're starting to see where the left-handed sacred might come in, because the left-handed sacred, I think, would be where the attraction repulsion thing is working in such a way that the, uh, the extremely yucky aspects, the difficult, difficult, difficult uh, to take aspects will maybe loom to the fore 
and the seductive attraction thing is in the background. But this is the point, um, and I'm sure Freudians are really good on this. Uh, there's so many things that we love that are, um, how shall I put it, work that music of attraction and repulsion. See, I think this is an extremely, extremely, extremely powerful um, uh, force in life, uh, anybody's life. Uh, and the trouble with it is that it covers, you know, can cover everything. <laughs> Most good concepts do. Uh, <laughs> and so you have to be sort of more careful how you're going to apply it. But for us, uh, or for me, I, let's, let's relax and uh, just work with this thing, this attraction and repulsion thing. And let's think, uh, all societies, um, since ever, uh, will uh, be very creative at coming up with this mix of attraction and compulsion, and it will get crystallized into a thing called religion or the church. Uh, and in the good old days, when religion was really like uh, full of uh, blood and, and, and thunder and, and uh, powerful ritual, um, and in some churches uh, in the world today, and, uh, and uh, still is, um, you could see this mixture, I think, of attraction and repulsion. My experience, not being much of a church person, I mean, I've only you know, been in church a handful of times, uh, my sense of religion in, 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 in modern churches in the US, England, and Australia was uh, really boring and quiet, you know. Now, that's, of course, a very um, severe generalization, but I, I wanted to sort of put an emphasis here. Um, I, think, I think I'm being really heavy-footed here. My, let me go back about a minute. Um, it, it, it seemed to me that this, the violence and the power of this um, mix is generally uh, been sanitized and subdued in modern Western uh, uh, countries. Um, and that's why I think it takes an effort, uh, an imaginative effort, to uh, get to this problem or issue of danger, ambiguity, attraction, and repulsion as a... Um, mm, the foundation, shall I put it that way? Of, of sacred, uh, sacred life, sacred force. <coughs> there will be plenty of churches, particularly in the U.S., uh, where you'll see something completely different, and you'll feel something completely different going on. I'm sort of talking about mainstream uh, Protestantism, mainstream uh, Christianity, um, and, and leave it at that. But uh, if you have any sort of uh, general experience of life. Uh, I think you'll find plenty, plenty of exceptions, but I still maintain that it's this um, notion of religion as gentle, as non-sacrificial, as uh, calm and even-handed um, is, is gets in the way uh, of this sensitivity to, to uh, things sacred. And that's why I, li I, guess I like uh, Larissa's uh, little essay so much, because uh, he doesn't talk about the church. He's talking about a force outside of the church, which you can find in, you know, sort of anybody's life, whether they're religious or not. And that's why it's such a good sort of doorway into thinking about more florid, more um, uh, evocative, you might say, examples. So with that in mind, that's, that's how I, I would approach this through my tie. And through and with the surrealist... Um, uh, interest in the marvelous, um, uh, you have a, um, a specification of, of that sense of the sacred. And that's why I went into this discussion yesterday, was it, or the day before, about um, thinking of that drawing as accessing the marvelous, uh, as opposed to the notion of images being used magically in order to get game or you know, have success in love or uh, whatever it might be <coughs> uh, to keep spirits away and all those sort of utilitarian aspects of, uh, of, uh, of magic. Uh, so if I come to think of the negative sacred, I wanted to stress that um, 
this drawing, this scene, is um, um, uh, partakes of the sacred in the ways I've just described. Um, accessing the marvelous uh, has a utilitarian function, the same way Fraser talked about magical amulets and talismans and so forth. Um, uh, has a sort of quality of emanating the spiritual uh, features of, uh, of um, absolute desperation that's involved in the scene by the freeway or the tunnel. Um, but it's very different to the sacred that the type uh, <coughs> talked about as positive sacred, which is the movement from death uh, to, um, to holiness. <coughs> And Bataille has, is very interested in this movement from repulsion to attraction, you might say. The, the horror of the corpse is something he talks about a lot. Um, and the way in which this horror, at least in Western uh, cultures, the way in which the horror um, of the dead body, the, the dead body is like, has an aura, if you like, of, uh, it's a frightening, uh, generally considered a very frightening um, thing. Um, moving through the rituals of burial and the church, <coughs> I'm thinking of the Christian church, which is, you know, I'm aware of that, but I'm, my example, the, the, the examples are very uh, ethnocentric, um, will move into some sort of uh, holy state which will ennoble both the cemetery and the church, just as the church has the bones of saints quite often uh, under the flagstones and so forth. So it's like this movement from uh, the, the, the sacred horror of the corpse, if you like, to the positive sanctity of the church and the priest and all of that. But again, that's just a movement within an ambiguous or ambivalent, ambivalent um, <coughs> polarity. The negative sacred seem to me in this picture of the people by the freeway to be um, something quite different. And I, um, that's, on, that's the beginning of this chapter 16. Um, and I was thinking about it this morning, what I would say to you, and I, I started to, to change it and I, as a result of some discussions and so forth. And I wrote, I think you've got to bear with me a little bit because to me it's a very dangerous or a very scary thing to talk about um, something as having a, a drawing of mine having sexual power. I mean, it's so like preposterous. Um, you know, you say, oh, come on. You know, cool a bit, will you? <laughs> As in the calm of a temple, I could have said church, but I chose temple as more capacious, different religions. As in the calm of a temple, dark and cool, there is a type of holiness made present by the people lying down in the concrete canyon of the entrance to the freeway tunnel. This is their grave. For those of you who just joined the class, you know, a, lot of the <laughs> a lot of what I've been talking about is uh, peeling an onion. And uh, the onion, the, the middle of the onion, well, I don't know, or the outside of the onion, was a drawing I did of some uh, homeless people in a, lying down in a huge uh, cliff face entrance, uh, a body of the <coughs> entrance to a tunnel. And sort of elaborated and elaborated and elaborated. And why draw an image? Why not just talk about it? Or what, etc., etc., and behind that, or in closing that, has been the virtues of um, a notebook over a finished published book. And thinking of an anthropological field or a notebook as um, a potential uh, piece of modernist literature with fragmentation um, and um, uh, drawings newspaper clippings, odd pieces of writing, amounting to something like a scrapbook. And part of this involved going into the possibilities and the characteristics of a scrapbook as a form of writing. And every now and again, it propped up this idea of uh, something magical, something to do with sorcery, something to do with, with religion. So that's why this discussion is occurring now. As in the calm of a temple, dark and cool, there is a type of holiness made present by the people lying down in the concrete canyon. This is their grave, their living grave, spectral, with the holy incense of car exhaust and the heavenly choir of internal combustion engines. 
hear the magic of which Benjamin, Benjamin speaks, as long as there is one beggar, is the magic of non-redemption. To me, it's the magic of non-redemption, of stasis and sludge congealing into petrified abjection. And that's a concept of, uh, I mean, the abject is a concept of, um, we've talked about it, I've talked about it a little before, uh, which comes up in Bataille's work, and Julia Christine wrote, wrote a whole uh, book about it, and they sort of covered some fun about that. that, that the objection is Charles taken off the breast too early, and the boundaries, conceptual boundaries get all over, and so on and so forth, and then she studies three or four French writers to sort of plot the abject in their work. It's called, in English it's called Powers of Horror. Um, and I want to go back just one second, I want to parenthesize, one of the things that I've been uh, thinking about a lot and writing about since um, probably the mid-80s uh, is the attraction to the powers of horror uh, as a way of thinking about uh, violence, whether it's domestic violence or whether it's large-scale political uh, violence. And I've been thinking, trying to think about the place of, quote-unquote, the sacred but remember the roots, you can sort of build in a pretty calm sort of way. Remember these three or four characteristics I gave about uh, the ambivalence, the danger, the mix of attraction and repulsion. You can think about sex in the same way, sex and art, sex and the sacred, you know, that might be more, uh, be more of a uh, and, and thinking about the place of something you would never think you would think about, uh, which has come up again a couple of times in this class which is the place of uh, sacred things in horrible things, the place of sacred things in, um, uh, in violence. Um, now, the, the object is a sort of, um, I think the object gets me closer to where I want to go with this non-redemptive uh, negative sacred. It's something just yuck uh, that is not going nowhere. You look at it, you, you, you'd be with a homeless person, you, you just flash past, which is an important part of this whole problem. You know, it's not like a prolonged humanizing uh, encounter. It's, and this is very typical, I think, of the modern world. Um, uh, it's very difficult to, to, you, to talk about that in terms of holiness and sacredness, right? But I want to have, I want to, I want to say that. I want to say there's something sacred about this, and it's what I would call the negative sacred or the abject. And if you don't talk about that, and if you don't see that, and you don't feel that, in my opinion, you're missing out on what I think we all feel. Name. I just want to say that iconographically, you're very close to Pieta. To whom? To Pieta, Mata Dolores, or Magdalene. Pieta. Pieta. Pieta King. Pieta King. La oh, La Pieta. Yeah. Tell me more. Um, <coughs> uh, <laughs> no, that we, well, we talked about this idea of comfort, you know, we, there's some of the words that came up. Oh, that's because you talked yesterday, you said there's a yeah, pity yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this morning I was thinking about you. Yeah. Always do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking, yeah, well, it's like, this woman, if she is a woman, is like the Virgin Mary. Yes, she's got, right. got a bit coney. And I thought, God, I am coney. <laughs> 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 well, it's not so boring. It's a tender image, right? But it endures all this. Uh, this um, I want to say cliched image. You know, we have these, the Madonna child. You know, it convey, it kind of, it kind of draws that to itself. You know, that this could be sort of a Madonna child image, you know, at first glance. So let's go back a bit. Why didn't you say what you just said? I said it because... Um, Can you guys hear? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at a lot of, at a lot of paintings, and you, you are used to, uh, um, to, to read images in, in a way that you um, kind of um, connect them to what you've seen before. And this came immediately into my mind when I saw this drawing. Oh yeah, I know that. And That's what you said last time, but why did you um, feel impelled to say that right now? Because we were talking about the sacred. Oh, see, I thought I was, I, I was <coughs> specifically referring to that 
to abjection and abject as a, as a sort of particular um, take, a particular wrinkle of what I have yet to define as negative sacred. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, talk about negative or positive sacred, but well, there's so some, some traits that is already in this, in this image. When Mary, when Mary is uh, 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 tenderly touching uh, Christ's womb and, uh, and, and stuff, it seems to me that is probably an example of involvement in the abject. <coughs> um, the medieval saints who love to torture themselves and fast and inflict wounds upon themselves, the Flemish paintings of what is it, 14th, 15th century, with the, with the gaping um, you know, with the <coughs> stigmata and so forth. It's, this seems to me perhaps an example of the abject uh, in the holy, that the holy here is thriving actually on the, um, on the wound. Sicko, you know, stuff. No? <laughs> Is that maybe what you're thinking about with that fit with the with the with the pity and uh, the tenderness? Um, I mean the, the, the pain and the shock is in in it. Okay. Alright. And this Good. moment of, of fading away. The fading away. Yeah, I mean this movement of I'm so sorry, I don't have an English, but um, this, this this movement of you you are passing by and there's a person that passed by and um, they're so so Oh the really ephemerality of it, the the, 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 movement, <laughs> the movement is in, in this drawing as the three so second uh, the three second view <coughs> yeah. so different velocities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me continue this uh, piece that I was working on this morning. He, the magic of which Benjamin speaks, as long as there is one beggar, quote unquote, is the magic, I say, of non redemption, of stasis and sludge, congealing into petrified objection. Here there is no Jesus bleeding on the cross, bound heavenward. Here there are no stations of the cross from crucifixion to redemption. Instead, what we see is a man being sewn into an island bag, the sort of bag people use to carry potatoes and corn on the back of a uduburu in a country run not by criminal gangs, that would be too simple, but by criminal gangs sustained by law with the tacit support of the US government. This is the sacred of the negative in spades, the sacred of the left hand, the hand of sorcery, not the upbeat, upbeat uh, sacred that in other places, such as that of the dead animal in Nascapi land, that I spoke about earlier, where the, uh, according to Frank Speck's ethnography of the early 1920s in Newfoundland, uh, the animal that is killed, the hunter sits by the animal for an hour or two, I can't believe it, and smokes a cigarette or two, uh, maybe prays and sometimes dances around the animal. Uh, and then Speck has this very functional take on it, which is, oh, uh, this is to pacify the master of the animals so that there will be more animals to hunt. And I can imagine Patai saying to, uh, to Frank Speck, or to the person Frank Speck, the indigenous person Speck is talking to, uh, well, let's go back a bit and see how you're asking the question and how well you know your language and all of that. Because couldn't this also be um, a way of accessing the marvelous? And it has no utilitarian uh, aim whatsoever. Or at least you have to take both positions into account. These are terribly difficult questions to answer, but mostly when you're taught in anthropology, it'll be the utilitarian one. The indigenous person is praying to the master of the animals or, or performing a ceremony at death, at killing. Uh, in order to, uh, so, it's almost like to calm uh, this, this master of the animals to provide more. Um, and that's why I sort of prefer the Bataille thing, which is like, this is this uh, accessing of the marvelous. Um, but I think one of the things that Bataille um, alerts you to is the impossibility of speaking at uh, such moments, the, the way in which uh, there are certain experiences in your life which are so uh, heart-rendering and 
powerful uh, that uh, language doesn't work for you, and at the same time you become dissolved as your, as your ability to um, describe becomes uh, threatened. So I think you as a person, or your skills as a, as a you know, more or less harmoniously combined uh, uh, self, uh, it also becomes becomes fractured. So if I was to talk about the access of the marvelous, I would want to include that that sort of problem. And then you might start to think again, what a picture, what does a picture contribute that works down? Uh, but always thinking about the self that is in relationship to this um, activity, because it's a self that is um, weird. It's a self that is maybe no longer a self or a previous self, and all that sort of stuff. You can make it up uh, as you go along. Um, I think that this is like limbo, or worse than limbo, um, uh, and it's quite unlike the human corpse in the Christian ceremony that passes under the positive sacred of the church. Um, here by the freeway, it's unlikely that the man in the nylon bag um, uh, will, will, ever, will ever leave that bag. Um, uh, and it's that sort of sense of holiness, or maybe if that's what I mean by, by the image of sacred. Um, This, this, this man in this bag, in this woman selling him into the bag, is as engraved in my memory, in my drawing, as much as he is in real life by the tunnel. And what I am left with, I say, is, is the experience, the shadows experience, the crud that lies at the bottom of the cheap bottle of wine. In other words, with the lived instant, which is to say the astonishment expressed by, I swear I saw this, and remember, and we must remember, uh, astonishment is nothing but the secular expression of enchantment in a disenchanted uh, uh, world. So I wanted to move from that sense of negative sacred, that sort of sense of um, some, something powerful that is very difficult to describe, something that is, uh, it's like the miracle turned upside down. Uh, it's where the repulsion in the combination of attraction and repulsion uh, is doing most of the work. Uh, and it also overlaps with um, uh, an expression which is left-handed, a uh, left-handed sacred, which implies uh, <coughs> the evil machinations of the sorcerer. I mean, I think they're two sort of separate activities, or they're two separate vocabularies, but I think there is a sort of interesting connection. And I, uh, um, being, you know, trying to be an enfant terrible. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thanks. Uh, <laughs> want to, uh, want to play the role of the sorcerer. I, I want to work, I want to work on texts like, uh, what Brian Geisen found in the ventilator shaft of the club, One Thousand and One Nights, because I think it's really cool, that combination of seven pebbles, <laughs> seven bits of glass or mirrors, and a, a Kabbalistic square. That's what I would like uh, this document to be equivalent to. And to follow Geisen and Burroughs, if you like, to produce a document which has a sorcery-like uh, effect, going back to the question of who are you writing for anyway? Um, so, um, I wanted to uh, uh, carry on the discussion then of this, what is the negative sacred, into this question of um, astonishment. Uh, and it occurred to me that to be astonished is to have the secular equivalent of the miracle. It's like the secular equivalent. Uh, it's like Michel Lerys. When he's trying to talk about, uh, as a sort of down to earth, calm, <laughs> rational thinker, and he's searching for examples of the sacred in everyday life. Everyday life, not the church, nothing to do with left handed sorcery. <coughs> and he's searching in childhood for these uh, instances. Um, it seems to me astonishment is um, an interesting secular equivalent to a religious uh, experience. But we can talk about astonishment much more easily, I think. It's, uh, can't, we, don't, we don't feel embarrassed, we don't feel uh, it's difficult to call. And um, it seemed to me um, staring me in the face that um, 
we have a vocabulary there which is sort of uh, religious, but it's not. And that's very handy to uh, have that uh, uh, attributives. And then I wanted to go on and talk about the um, place of non-astonishment, that terrible things happen in, in the world around us uh, at which uh, we may be astonished for a moment, but then the astonishment gives way. And uh, I decided that finally that's what that image was about. It was not so much about astonishment, but about the uh, way you deal with astonishment. And you and I talked a bit about that, and you were sort of, well, you weren't too happy with that formulation, right? Um. No, 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 next to you. <laughs> I, I mean, I was just uh, trying to, I was a bit skeptical. Yeah. Time. For those of you who, who this first day here or something, I mean, I was talking about the way you become numb to the shit around you. And uh, take poverty in India, a classic cliche, cliche example. You get out of the plane in Delhi and come. I mean, it's just very, very difficult. Or you go walk in Medellin, which is where this picture was drawn. Um, and the first day or two, you see a lot of really shocking things. You're astonished. And then by the third or fourth day, you become used to it. You no longer react in the way you did. And I was, uh, I was so tempted to think of uh, this image as an image of astonishment. And the more I thought about it, when the taxi driver was asked, why do the people lie here? And he says, because it's warm in here, talking about this unlit tunnel full of flames and, and, and four lanes of traffic and so on and so forth. Um, when he says it's warm in here, that to me is like uh, the symbol, the indication, the moment whereby you normalize the abnormal. And we were talking a bit about what exactly does that mean? Does it mean you become a total asshole and insensitive to the shit that's around you? Uh, or does it mean that you actually have a double optic? You have two things at least going on in your mind. And at certain points, this um, blunting uh, will suddenly give way. And there'll be a, a very uh, interesting and painful and strange reaction to the eruption of danger and the abnormality of the world, and then that will subside as the norm takes its place. And I think we've spoken about that quite a bit, right? Well, yeah, I was also just thinking about the connection of the sacred with the state of emergency. Um, oh, that's such a good way of putting it. And, and the negative sacred as having a glimpse of this state of emergency or taking it to its conclusion. I mean, sometimes I think of the state of emergency as being conditioned by the sacred itself. Or justified by it. Well, think back for a minute to the uh, coincidence here of um, Schmidt's book. It's called Political Theology, <laughs> and the very first, very first sentence is, uh, "Sovereign is he who decides the exception." And the tract is called Theology. Theology. He was on the ball, Al Schmidt. And he was a fascist. Um, uh, but he saw the politics as ever so much bound up with uh, theology. Um, I, um, yeah, I like that. Um, someone else had a hand up. Yeah. Surely our task is not to do this more art historical thing, which is say, oh, here's an image drawn by some idiot who can't draw, namely myself, and I can show you uh, in the um, genealogy or the history of Western art that this corresponds to a big family of powerful images that have been around for, you know, for 2,000 years or 1,000 years. And a lot of people stop there, right? And I think what's interesting is, first of all, this is pointed out to me, and I thank you for that. And, I, and, and secondly, that you want to get inside, inside uh, the, um, how shall I put it, the meaning of that tenderness and that uh, mixture of abjection and, 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 and holiness that's involved there. And that's why, for better or for worse, you know, that the time uh, vocabulary that I'm using is, uh, is um, important. But uh, I have friends, for example, you know the image from Abu Ghraib, the famous one? Mm -hmm. of the, <coughs> yeah, and, and, and they, they seem to assume that if you point out that that's a pieta, is that the term? 
that you're sort of, that's it. That's really, you know, but you want to go further than that. You want to sort of talk about, well, what's involved in that relationship. So simple point. But let me ca come on, carry on a bit here because we're getting, moving on time-wise. And I, I wanted to say that um, one way of thinking of this doubleness of the, I, I, I think I'm sounding so simple-minded that, that these things are better done in poetry, <laughs> actually. But um, this doubleness that's involved, this schizophrenic quality um, of the <coughs> abnormality of the abnormal and how um, that can uh, uh, change places, how that can be ruptured, that the facade of the normality can be challenged by, by something that you come across and, and you, for the moment, are, are, are totally flawed and then it, normality reasserts itself. I was thinking it's at that point probably that something like a nervous system uh, strategy of writing uh, comes into play. These are the sorts of um, doublenesses, the schizophrenic, the contradictory qualities in everyday life as much as in storytelling and in macro politics that one is, I think, automatically alive to. And they're the places to uh, massage and, and make films about and work upon. Um, how to do that? That's where you get back to Murray's question, you know, about writing and the craft. Um, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the um, notion of a swarm of spirits. But before I do that, I wanted to uh, quote um, Auden, the famous English poet, uh, who writes about suffering, relating to this poem, and relating to abjection, relating to horror, relating to that sort of shitty world around us. About suffering they were never wrong, says Auden. The old masters, how well they understood its human position. That is to say, the human position of suffering. How much there is all around us, how ubiquitous it is, how suffering takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. So the everydayness of disaster. And then I add, or you might add, just sitting in a taxi, the driver saying they lie in the tunnel because it's warm in there. You see where he's going with this. Organ is saying, it's so incredibly normal, this suffering, and the old poets and the old painters knew this very well. And he points to this same uh, painting of Bruegel that Brecht pointed to. <coughs> in Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, says Lord Gordon in his poem, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. So this is what I think is in this, in this drawing. And I wanted to take the, first of all, I wanted to take the shock and astonishment route. And you've heard some of the moves that can be made in that direction, and they're exciting, and, and, and it seems to make a lot of sense. But then I think you have to go that extra mile and flip the whole thing over and say, you know, the really shitty thing about this is you don't recognize another arm or the taxi driver, you get none to it. And we've had our, it's obviously an ongoing discussion. Yet, is it not the point of the poem, Gordon's poem, as much as Brecht's commentary, the, a boy? That's Icarus falling from the sky, and all you can see are the two little legs. The, part, the, the picture's about this big, and the legs are about this big. You know, you hardly even see them. You see ships at anchor, you see someone fishing, you see the plowing, plowing, the clouds moving in the sky, and the whole thing is called the fall of Icarus, and Icarus is about that big. You know, you need a microscope almost to see that, and it's not even see him, you see these two little yellow legs. Looks crazy, looks silly. Um, the point of the poem, as much as Brett's commentary, that a boy falling from the sky is astonishing! But even more astonishing is the lack of astonishment. You with me? <laughs> so where does that place us? Uh, uh, my sense is um, that what is released by this, this drawing, <coughs> to summarize, is not an act of redemption or catharsis, but a spewing force of the, of the negative sacred, but a swarm of spirits. Uh, like deaths, and I have a strange list here, and I wanted to explain this list. Like deaths from drowning, hanging, trauma, and from violence in general, such deaths cannot be appeased, no matter how moving the rituals, no matter how still the stillness, because I've emphasized stillness in this image quite a bit. 
This is when and how the abnormality of the normal springs forth <clears throat> and calls into being the twofold leap, the normality of the abnormal, to which I have referred as the spell that breaks the spell, that stiller than still stillness, so still it sweeps all before it like the river of steel pouring into the tunnel of no return. And I was thinking here of uh, an essay by Robert Hertz uh, called um, Collective Representations of Death. Uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous essay uh, uh, about, I don't know, about 1910 maybe, called The Collective Representations of Death. And uh, Hertz was killed in the First World War uh, and as a soldier. And he studied with Durkheim and uh, Marcel Mauss. <coughs> uh, Mauss's nephew. And he, basing his um, uh, writing on death rituals throughout uh, the, what you call, call, call the Third World, focusing to a large extent on Indonesia, where death rituals are very <coughs> fabulous. Uh, he focused in on the two two types. The, the funerals consist of two stages. The first stage, which is the um, dealing with the body as a physical object, uh, and the second stage, maybe a year later or two years later, there was this huge, 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 huge uh, sort of celebration. And he says, but there are certain deaths which cannot be appeased, and the spirits keep coming back, no matter how. Uh, extraordinary the ceremony, no matter how thorough and so forth. And he gives a list uh, in his sort of survey of the sorts of deaths, which is basically what the list I just read out. And um, I, um, the sort of anthropology that I like uh, or, or want to push is um, an anthropology at, as a lot along the lines of that comment of Wittgenstein's so there is a mythology in our language or in that article of mine, Sunsets Take You Back, which is not so much to think of something from the past lingering on in the present, but something in the present that can still use what's in our language or use what's in our collective memories to talk about the present and the future. Uh, I keep thinking this must be still, this still must happen, that there are deaths and violences which occur which no ritual can appease. You know, I often used to wonder about like, the, the murder of assassination of 60, 80,000 indigenous people in Guatemala and it's such a religious uh, community, such a religious society, uh, the indigenous society of Guatemala and with elaborate death rituals and tremendously strong beliefs in spirits. <clears throat> I couldn't believe that there wasn't this sense of foreboding that the quantities of dead are sort of hovering around and very, very difficult <laughs> to get them to stay away. Because talk about the sacred, you know, by and large, and I must emphasize the enormity of my generalization, by and large, uh, the spirits of the dead are not um, your best friends. I mean, you may be very, you grieve and you're sorry, it may be, but one usually has an ambivalent relationship to people, especially people in your own family, and especially in a large extended family. So, you know, I don't want to get all soft and gooey on you and say it's all because this dear departed person and you feel sorry for. Of course there's going to be that element of strong grief. But there's also going to be an element that please, please, dead people, stay in your place, you know. And if we're in Mexico, we might invite them back once a year and go to the cemetery and give them food and, and flowers and stuff like that. But that's a way of actually keeping them at bay. And I, I imagine some of you are aware of this. But when the deaths are due to uh, unritualizable, uh, uh, cannot be ritualized away, when the dead cannot be kept away, that's when something very, uh, I think, incredible is going on. Um, 